Hi everyone, thanks for joining the Avanti Interchange Debrief webinar today. I'm John Bartz with Network Consulting Services, and we survived another interchange in Nashville. Our NCSI team spent the week gathering all the highlights that we're going to share with you now. And with me today is our CTO, Brian Hosnick, and our ISM expert, Lisa Rowe. Good morning and good afternoon, Brian and Lisa. <laughs> good afternoon. Hi, everybody. So, Brian, we picked up, we picked up some awards last week. Do you want to share the news? Yes, I'm uh, very pleased to announce that uh, NCSI won the 2019 Expert Solution Provider of the Year, um, and our very own Brian Hoskins won the Sales Engineer of the Year. So uh, great job, team. Um, it really was a team effort, everyone coming together to uh, make sure we enable our customers to have success with the Avanti products. So uh, congratulations, everyone, and thanks for a great year, and here's uh, hoping we'll win it again next year. Um, so I want to talk about the agenda really quick of, of what we're going to describe on uh, today's webinar. Um, first, we're going to start with uh, some updates as it relates to Service Manager. Um, so Lisa's going to walk us through a lot of Service Manager updates. Um, then we want to talk about the Avanti Cloud. That was a big part of Interchange. Um, we want to try and demystify it a little bit and talk about the particulars more of Avanti Cloud. Then we're going to jump into uh, some updates around the Unified Endpoint Management Suite, Devonti Security Controls, Workspace Management, Automation, and um, Asset Management as well. So that's kind of our agenda today. Um, for those that weren't able to attend, you can see we have uh, there Steve Daly and Steve Morton, President and CMO of, of Avanti, jamming out at our booth with uh, our President, Mr. Bohm, in the background. It was a, it was a big hit having the uh, rock band there at our booth, uh, rocking out in Music City in Nashville. So. Um, let's uh, pass it over to Lisa to talk about uh, Service Manager and, and what new announcements were made uh, around ISM. All right, awesome. Um, so there was a big focus this year on expansion of Service Manager, um, you know, extending it out to not only users but um, global reach. Um, I'll cover some UI changes that um, that were announced. Some good stuff is coming our way, and then. Um, extensibility, and then I'll talk a little bit about the stuff that will be coming out in the late 2019-2020, um, perhaps beyond after that. <clears throat> so under um, expansion, uh, expansion under the, uh, on the next slide, Mr. Hodzik, um, empowerment and functions. So Ivanti really, just what I garnered, um, they're really focused on uptick in user empowerment and expanding not only how people use ISM, but um, allowing people to access it from whatever device they want, um, the different ways that they can access it, really trying to make ease of use a thing. So um, one of the things that we've all been waiting for for a long time is the Skype for Business connector. Um, that is available right this minute out on the Ivanti Marketplace. Uh, it supports integration not only into your incident workflow, but I know, and I apologize, the screenshot is uh, not the best resolution, but it was the best one I could get. Um, it integrates right at your fingertips. You would have the end user record profile. Um, you can create or update records right from chat without having to switch your screens. So um, I know you can't read the little update ticket, message there, but you have the user's profile, and if you have this chat and you want to update a specific record, then it's going to say, do you want to update the ticket with this chat? You click yes, and that appends a note into the record. So it's, it's good stuff. We've been waiting for it for a long time. Um, next was the Ivanti Hub and Chatbot. AI was a huge focus this year. Anybody who was at Interchange couldn't get away without hearing from it. Um, so the Avanti Heaven chatbot will be available very soon. Um, on the next slide, we can see the, a, a good screenshot of Hub. So Hub, um, it's an application that you can put into any device. Um, it brings support to users in a super simple format. So instead of having to go out to the web portal, a lot of people don't like to, you can download this app to your users' desktops, or they can even put it on their phones. Um, and from the hub, they can um, access the full service catalog. So whatever you have published out, even your own um, request offering creations, those can be published out through the hub. Um, they can access knowledge and facts. Um, 
The bot right now, so that is another application that you can add to it. The bot right now only has access to the out-of-box request offerings. I know they'll be doing a lot of work on the bot to make it better, um, but this is a great way for people to, who don't want to necessarily talk to somebody or don't have the time to get up and talk to somebody. They can sit there on the chat, talk with the bot in a nice conversational way and do things like, you know, log their records, um, make things happen. The more that people use this, the more that AI is going to be trained and it will start understanding the way people talk and, and what they're saying and what it is that they really want. Um, you can, from the hub, you can access it again directly from like an icon on your desktop or you can throw it into your taskbar. So it's a, I don't know, I think it's really cool functionality. Uh, I've read a couple of articles from different analysts over the last couple of years and they, they say, they're guessing by 2020 that probably 25% of service desk um, jobs will be done by AI at this point, which is cool because this means that your service desk folks, especially the lower tier folks, can start learning more challenging stuff and be happier overall. Um, next, I would like to talk a little bit about some of the UI improvements. Um, those, uh, there, there is a new skin. It's called CDL2. This is for the analyst side of the interface, but as you can see, it's a much nicer color scheme. Well, I think it's nicer. It's more muted. Um, they, they did some nice improvements to it. It's better or less garish colors, I'll say. The contrast is better. The fonts are bigger. Um, if you go to the next slide, Brian, even on the workspaces, you can see that um, it's spaced out a little bit better than it was before. It's a little less crammed together. And they brought some graphics into the nice uh, preview down at the bottom. So it was pretty cool functionality. Um, so they're, they're doing that. If you've already made dashboard or style edit changes, like put your own branding, your logos, your colors, um, that will not be overwritten if you select that CDL2, but you will have the new colors on the dashboards and the bigger space and bigger fonts. So um, the other thing, and I don't have a screenshot of it because I don't think it's available quite yet, um, they're talking about doing what they call vanity URLs. And this is something that is huge. So it's different options. You can make different skins for different groups within your organizations and give them their own URL to access. So for instance, um, you might have HR or facilities and they might need a much more simple interface. Um, you can create one for them and give them that URL and have them log in. Um, we have a couple of managed service clients and I think that um, those clients could make big use of this, especially you know, if they want their external customers to access their service manager instance, they can even brand it with the customer's logos and stuff. So pretty cool stuff. Um, moving on, we have uh, a big upgrade coming in the API. This is something that um, we desperately need. So on the block coming down the road um, is supposed to be the ability to create, update, or retrieve any business object in the system. This is um, whether it is a related or even a composite business object. Um, you can develop templates and apply templates to incoming records from the API, which is fantastic. If you have API um, integration from perhaps your monitoring tool, you'll be able to create the template so it can be categorized, coded, and routed right to the NOC and you don't have to have your service desk go over all of these records and, and route them. Um, you'll be able to execute full text searches, do quick actions, um, execute save searches, and not only save searches, but you'll also be able to filter. So if perhaps you wanted to see the top 10 incident types for um, June, you'll be able to write that query and you'll be able to have the API call and have that run. So um, pretty nifty stuff. And then um, further expansion. So <laughs> Ivanti Cloud, you're going to, Hodzik's going to show it to you in a few minutes. Um, Ivanti Cloud is definitely where it's at um, coming in late night, 2019 or 2020, they are going to expand the Ivanti cloud capabilities to include ISM. So you'll have your smart advisor, the real-time intelligence, um, that is the querying uh, with natural language. 
So you can um, query with natural language questions and get your, your results back. Um, CMDB will be able to be populated via Evante Cloud into ISM. And then you can obviously create actions and um, do record creation from Evante Cloud into ISM. Um, another thing that they are focusing on specifically with Evante Cloud back to AI is machine learning. Um, so machine learning and automation, the more we use it, the more it's going to understand. But they are looking to expand out to third-party products. So they're not trying to stay necessarily just in Evante world. They're going to start creating um, connectors to additional external product sets. Um, and then from a UI perspective, uh, something that we have been waiting for is the Analyst mobile interface. This is a big and exciting deal. Um, initially, they're going to roll it out with incident only, um, and then they will, in additional subsequent rollouts, they will go ahead and add the extra modules. Um, and they're also making more changes to the web UI. But th this is the big thing is the, the mobile interface. People have been asking for that for a long time. And then one of the other nice things that they're doing is um, expanding languages, right? They're trying to um, get more of a global outreach. I think Arabic is next on their, on their agenda, and that's a big deal because it's right to left writing instead of left to right. So, and I know that there's going to be a couple of languages, um, new Asian languages, I think Vietnamese and Malay perhaps. But it, again, just to recap, they're really focused on ease of use for users, um, expansion of how people interact with ISM, and then more of a global outreach. So good times. Hey, Lisa, um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, and I'll open it up to everyone else. Uh, please use the Q&A feature here, and we'll try and answer the questions kind of in real time. So uh, throw some questions out there if you want. Um, so tell me about the, the hub and the chatbot. Um, I can get ISM on-premise or in the cloud. Are hub and chatbot available on both platforms? No. So hub and chatbot are cloud only. They are cloud only. So again, as I said at the beginning, you know, cloud is where it's at these days. Um, I don't think that they plan. They're going to have to keep some measure of control over the AI. So <laughs> the plan is to have that cloud only. Okay. What about the um, the hub? Uh, so that's a desktop application. What operating systems does it support? So it supports any OS. Um, and I spoke with Ian, and this is off the record, which is great because we're on a webinar. Um, he says that that is also supposed to be cloud only, but he knows that probably we will figure out a way around that and be able to load it to people's on-premise instances. So just saying. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, you know, the several things we just brought up here about being cloud only um, and some of the logic and the AI that comes with that, um, you know, that's a really good parlay into our, our next conversation, which is the new product, Avanti Cloud. Um, and so I want to kind of uh, describe a little bit more about what Avanti Cloud really means um, and actually give you a demonstration of what it, what it looks like, because it really is the, the future of Avanti and the future of, uh, you know, a lot of technology. So, um, one thing that we need to keep in mind is, from a, a naming perspective, it is confusing. I was just as confused as everybody else, so hopefully I can kind of straighten it out right here. There are existing products in the Avant por Avanti portfolio that we often say are in the cloud. So, you know, like Service Manager, like Lisa was just talking about, or License Optimizer, or Asset Manager. Um, all of these things can exist in the cloud. However, there is a brand new product that is not not directly related to any of those existing products called Avanti Cloud. So it's brand new. Um, almost certainly nobody on the uh, webinar here has used it or maybe even just seen little pieces of it. Um, and it is really going to be the unifying engine behind all of Avanti's technology. And we'll kind of talk about that a little bit more. But, um, you know, a lot of its important pieces are the real-time capabilities, you know, being able to understand exactly what's happening right now not waiting 24 hours, not waiting a week to get an inventory scan, but being able to see that imaging or that Im information uh, in real time. Um, connectors, being able to ingest information from our own tools, our own Avanti tools, but then also third-party tools. So uh, we don't want to live in an island where everything has to be Avanti. We don't want to be able to connect to uh, other systems. Um, our data services, and, and this is really where the magic is. Um, this all happens behind the scenes, and anyone that's had to deal with things like inventory or uh, reconciliation, they know that that is very problematic and takes a lot of work. 
Now we can ingest data from multiple sources and you don't have to babysit that normalization or reconciliation. It just takes care of it for you. So if we find something uh, from ISM or bring in something from uh, EPM or Active Directory, we're going to understand that that's the same device and not create duplicate records and understand that it's you know, reconciled into a single record. Um, smart advisors, this is where it's going to give us recommendations that maybe we wouldn't have thought of. So, um, you know, I'll show you kind of what those look like, but uh, recommendations so you don't have to go and find all of the information and know all of the questions. It can help you ask uh, a lot of the questions. Um, and then provide actual actions upon those questions. We don't want to just say uh, what information we have out there, what devices, but we want to act upon it. Um, and that integrates with our automation, you know, uh, not doing things by hand or uh, with, with human effort is incredibly important. So being able to automate simple tasks or even complex tasks um, to uh, make our uh, fulfillment of services, fulfillment of different things to the end user uh, be a lot quicker. Um, so the Avanti Cloud is kind of the center of all of this. We are going to bring in information from endpoint management, from service management, asset management, endpoint security. You know, these are the things that we're going to ingest into the Avanti Cloud. Um, it is a relatively new product. So we don't have all these connectors and all of these ingestion points created today. Um, you're going to see some with Endpoint Manager. Um, Lisa talked about the future, how we're going to be able to connect over to uh, service management. Um, so know that this is an evolving process. And on day one, it doesn't have you know, all of the features just there yet. So we'll talk about the ones that you know, are there today. Um, so you're going to be able to connect to these third-party applications, be it something like Microsoft SCCM or our data center discovery product or Active Directory or a third party like a selling company, like a CDW, something like that. We're going to ingest that data, normalize it, um, clean up the attributes, reconcile it all together. So that makes our consumption of that data be a lot more filtered. Um, that way you don't have to worry about uh, you know, cleaning up the data first. So uh, real time, uh, just like I described, being able to get information right out of the system um, of what's going on right now. Where are my devices? What kind of processes are running? What's the CPU usage? Um, those kinds of real time things you're going to be able to pull from um, uh, the, the Avanti cloud. Um, a natural language search. Um, you know, we've, we've gotten to a custom of things like Google that we can just type in kind of whatever we want and it's smart enough to find it. So, uh, you know, making it so that uh, any human can type in what their question is and being able to answer what that looks like. Um, only need to have a browser, you know, Vaunty Cloud. It's obviously cloud-based. It's just going to be a web interface that you're using to, uh, to interact with this system. Um, and uh, obviously scalable and secure um, and all the power that you need because it's running up in the cloud. They can expand and contract um, the, the computing resources uh, as needed. So uh, one thing I'd like to do is actually jump in and show you what this looks like. Um, at Interchange, we got a couple of kind of teasers of this, um, but I'd like to actually open up my cloud instance here and walk you through uh, how you would use this. So uh, this is my tenant. This is uh, you know set up for my organization. So I only see my information, um, and I can go click on the dashboards here, and this is going to give me kind of my landing page where it's going to add certain things like smart advisors or um, uh, different widgets that I would want to have here. So I can go and add a widget or change the layout. You can see a lot of these smart advisors just come right out of the box. You know, what is the warranty status of my device? Um, what Windows OS versions? Um, should I do uh, imaging or replacing? You know, what's interesting about that is, you know, how does it come up with that kind of logic? That's that's a, a relatively complex thing to uh, to ask. Well, we can take several different attributes into uh, in, into mind when we're calculating this. You know, what version are we running? What is the warranty associated with the uh, with the device? What is the uh, the Windows life cycle for that particular build that we're running. What is the free disk space? How much RAM do they have? What version is it? So um, it can go and understand that kind of more complex logic and give me recommendations. It's telling me that I need to re-image 34 machines. It's telling me that I need to replace 16 machines. Um, and uh, you know maybe it's going to replace the machines that are out of warranty, for example. So uh, being able to bring a little bit more intelligence to the equation um, rather than me having to go and ask that question. And what's great about it being in the cloud is these 
um, uh, smart advisors are going to always be up to date. They're always going to be the latest version. Um, it's going to bring that uh, automatically into my console. I don't have to go and ask for it or go do an upgrade or anything like that. It's just going to you know, magically show up uh, in my console. So um, the next thing we have is patch intelligence. So patch intelligence um, takes our robust patching knowledge that we have. Remember, Avanti has one of the largest patch management uh, um, engines in the world. Um, be able to, to bring some context to that. So for example, it's going to break it down showing me what the top vendors were or the bulletin types or even telling me what the last Microsoft Patch Tuesday was. Uh, you know, everything's a menu. I can click on anything. It's going to narrow it down down here in the bottom. It's going to tell me more information about it. Um, we're going to have uh, a cool thing like a comments field. So this is actually going to be comments about this particular patch, and that could be anything from user comments or there needs to be some kind of prerequisite or some kind of feedback outside of my ecosystem about this patch. In the past, when I downloaded a patch to my uh, server, I was kind of in an island. Is this causing blue screens of death? Well, I don't know. You know, I'd have to go read some blog somewhere. So now I can get that information kind of delivered to me right here in the comments section. Um, we match that information over to CVEs. So CVEs are popular because they are what the security team speaks about. You know, we, we in, in operational security usually think about uh, patches. Oh, we need to worry about, you know, MS017-010. Yet the security uh, organization says, no, we care about CVE-2019-0671. So this gives us the ability to marry those two together so we can understand CVE-2 um, patch. So that's our patch intelligence. Um, now we can actually go look at our, our individual devices. So um, here I have um, all the individual devices that I uh, have in my uh, cloud instance today. Um, this gives me the ability to, uh, you know, pull up inventory, for example. So I can go and search uh, the database for any machines that, that I have. So I have a, uh, one of my test machines right here. I'm going to open it up. It's going to give me an inventory view of it. Um, it's going to tell me the last time it ran a hardware or vulnerability scan. It gives me a geolocation up here in the top. I can see the real-time performance. I can see what kind of CPU usage it's doing. Uh, you can see I'm getting that information every five minutes. I could adjust the time on how quickly I retrieve that information. No information about the network, memory usage, storage, et cetera. Uh, and then a map. It goes down and says, you know, exactly where this particular device um, is. And this one's at my house. Um, so very, very detailed information on what's going on from a real-time perspective. Um, but then also I'll show you a bit later, I've integrated with this EPM. So that traditional EPM data, if I needed to get into the, the nitty-gritty details of what software is installed or uh, what, uh, you know, what individual um, IP addresses or network card address or, you know, anything that we showed in a traditional EPM uh, scan shows up in this uh, inventory as well. And we have a search box up here at the top. So um, that shows us all of our devices, and I'll talk about kind of where those devices come from here in a little bit. Um, but uh, first, I want to show off a little bit more about real-time intelligence. Now, in my opinion, this was the real wow factor. The first time I saw this, I, I said, okay, this is the future. I know where we're going, um, and it needs to be uh, with this real-time intelligence. So this is our natural language search engine. Um, and if you're not really sure where to start, they give us some great hints down here at the bottom. So let's click on one. Let's click on the security dashboard. So the security dashboard kind of gives just a bunch of security related functions. Um, and you can see uh, it, it gives me a judgment overall of a security health. Uh, but if I want to get into some of the more particulars, I can look down here at the bottom. Okay, so here's user account control. So this is UAC inside of Windows. You know, show me all the devices that are enabled or disabled. And, and we can very easily click on one or, and disable that particular section of the pie chart. But, you know, if I want to know who that is, I have one machine that this is disabled on. I can click on it. It's going to give me that result saying that it's actually the laptop I'm on right now has it disabled. Um, and uh, the state is disabled, what if I want to do something about that? This is the big difference between knowing something about it or having a piece of information about a device and actually acting upon it. This is where it gets really exciting. Over here on the side, I have the ability to add an action. Now, I've already created a custom action here called Enable UAC Then Reboot. So it's actually going to turn on UAC and it's going to reboot. So I know that sounds like a relatively simple thing, but you know that's, that's a pretty complex set of actions that's, that's happening right there. Um, I have another example over here. 
uh, that talks about BitLocker. So if I want to go in here and say, uh, you know, I have several devices with uh, BitLocker, I have three here um, that are not using uh, BitLocker today. Again, I've created an action that is enable BitLocker. So it's going to go through and enable that BitLocker. Maybe it's going to send out a reboot action. Um, but if I want to do something custom, it's just not that hard. I can click on Add Action. Um, in my actions here, I can choose from a list of existing things that are kind of prefabricated, uh, things like stopping a process, starting a service, um, isolating an endpoint, restarting a machine, you know, lots of different things associated with that. Uh, but I can also go create my own custom action. So if I want to create a new action, um, I have the ability to do that, and that could be anything from uh, a PowerShell script to um, you know, sending an email to interacting with things like Azure or taking a snapshot of the virtual machine. Lots of different functions exist in our, uh, our automation engine here. So we can make it so that uh, uh, it's very easy to take action upon those, um, those pieces of information that you find. Um, so we have a, another good example of that down here. One of the next um, examples that they give out um, is the ability to look at local admins. So I can look at local admins and say, tell me where I am find unexpected local admins. Ah, well, I found one right here. Uh, who's this person, Lisa, um, is <laughs> local administrator on her machine. If I wanted to get rid of that, I could go and say, remove that from local admin. Hey, now. now. <laughs> <laughs> do it, I promise. Um, so if I'm an administrator, I don't want to have to go look at this every day and click on these items. So we have the ability to create these alerts. So I can say I want to create alert associated with that. So now it says if the local account equals unexpected, or we can even just leave that on the default because we were in the context of local administrators being unexpected, I can add an action down here in the bottom and I can say remove from local admin. So when I do that and I click Save, I'm not going to do it because I actually do it to Lisa's machine. It's going to take that action of removing local admins and have it be an alert. I don't think alert's like the exact right wording for it because that makes it sound like I'm getting an email, but it's an automated action. So I can say when something happens, don't wait for me to go and have to go do something against it. Let's automatically have that action happen. So uh, that's how we do it with uh, the alerting. Um, uh, other options in here, we have some cool ones like uh, logon performance. So logon performance is just going to track the logon performance of my machines and then categorize them via excellent, very good, average, poor, terrible, etc. Um, and you have this cool little char charting option here, trending. You can go in and say, I want to trend this data. So I could say, well, I want to trend um, the logon time, and I'm going to collect the data over, you know, maybe 90 days. How often I'm going to collect that data? Log on time, we only, really only log in once a, a day, so probably 24 hours is sufficient. And then it's going to log for just me or everyone that logs in the system is going to have access to this data. So what that does, is it, it pops it up here, I actually turned it on before, that's going to now trend that information over time, and I can use that for troubleshooting in the future. So I can understand if log on performance is having problems, or it's going up, or it's going down, um, and I can understand over time what's happening with that data versus it being just a uh, a single point in time. Um, all right, so let's use that natural language uh, search up there at the top. So I can really type in anything that I want to. Let me show you another cool example. Uh, sorry, let me jump back here. If, if I open up uh, an application, so I'm running uh, Putty here on my workstation, um, I can actually say things like, who is running putty.exe? So it understands that logic of what I was saying, that I wanted to know the process state of putty.exe. I didn't have to come to the table with a huge amount of knowledge saying process state, parentheses, executable. I, I didn't need to know that. Um, it, it learned that and understood that on my behalf. So I can just type that in there. So uh, a really cool function right here to, sh to demonstrate the true real-time nature of it um, I can go here and uh, look at this particular application, um, and it's a little bit hard in a single monitor here, but you can see I can stop the process, and that's going to terminate that action on that machine. So when we say real time, I mean, we're talking under seconds, you know, milliseconds here, not what oftentimes we lived in the Avanti world of the past that, you know, quickly meant sometime in the next couple of days. Um, we, we can mean quickly 
incredibly fast. Uh, so from like a security perspective, a lot of people always want to say, you know, who, who's listening on what ports or who's connecting to what IP addresses or, you know, who's running certain sets of the applications. This gives us the ability to, um, you know, be able to find that very, very quickly. Um, how we do that is a really fancy um, uh, IoT technology called, I'll get it wrong, but MQTT I think is what it is. And, and you can see we're actually individually talking to the devices right here, right now. And it's telling me which devices are responding uh, versus how many are registered, et cetera. So uh, it, it makes it very, very low bandwidth. Bandwidth was always a big concern when we were talking about doing things on such a rapid pace. Um, however, uh, the, the, the MQTT or whatever that IoT protocol is, um, was designed for incredibly um, uh, expensive bandwidth concerns, like if you're using a satellite or something like that. So very, very efficient when it comes to uh, from a bandwidth perspective. So this natural language search is, is really cool. I, I can't show it to you right now because I already clicked on it this morning, but I ran a query yesterday um, that was notepad.exe. And it came back with a question and it said, you know what, I don't know what you mean. I don't know what, what you asked me because I just said notepad.exe. And when I went to log in this morning uh, to get ready for the webinar, a little thing popped up at the bottom. And I apologize, I should have took a screenshot of it. Uh, but it says, hey, wait a minute. You asked me a question yesterday. I didn't know the answer to it. I know the answer to it now. That's really the big concept behind machine learning um, is being able to get more intelligent over time. So where a question we maybe didn't know the answer to in the past or didn't even understand the context of the question, now we have the ability to answer that with more information has come to light or you know you didn't have that particular process running on your network and now you do uh, those kinds of things so we're going to improve over time and you don't need to go into an upgrade to make that happen it just popped up and said hey i know how to answer that now and before i didn't so uh, i thought that was really really cool um okay so uh, there's lots of other options here i won't go through all of them um, but uh, real-time intelligence is, is absolutely one of my favorite uh, pieces of the puzzle here. Um, all right, so smart advisors, we already uh, showed you some of these. They were in my dashboard. Um, uh, one of the really cool ones is this device reconciliation. So device reconciliation, um, customers tell me all the time, I barely know what kind of data that I have. I, I have so many different sources of data, I can never understand which one is correct, which one's the source of truth. So this gives me a, a cool way to compare the two. So for example, I have Active Directory and I have Endpoint Manager. Um, and what I can do up here is I can say, how many devices are in both? Well, I have 134 devices. If I go and uh, drag this over to the other side, now what I'm asking is, I want to know which devices are in Active Directory, but they are not inside of EPM. So what I'm saying is, I, I want to make sure that if they exist in Active Directory, do I have an EPM agent installed on them? And it says, oh, absolutely, you have a bunch missing. So here I have uh, missing devices because they do not exist in the EPM side of the equation. So this can be expanded to lots of different connectors that we have, um, you know, to SCCM, to uh, a, a CDW import. This is only going to improve over time. So we're going to be able to connect to these other um, devices, and we are going to be able to um, reconcile the differences between multiple sources of truth, because we know there's not just one ultimate source of truth. So um, uh, I thought the device reconciliation was, was really, really cool. Um, so again, more smart advisors, uh, you know, anything from inventory information, Windows lifecycle, disk space, um, warranty. Uh, I see someone had a question here, where is the uh, warranty information coming from? Uh, we have a couple of different places that we can uh, pull information from. Uh, first being our data analytics package inside of the uh, EPM can pull warranty information. Uh, but we've always had kind of a rocky relationship with that, um, whereas, uh, you know, an API would change or uh, we're, we're unable to resolve something. Um, and it was a real pain in the neck to get that up to date because oftentimes it's like, well, you've got to go and do an upgrade. Okay, well, it takes us three months to go through the upgrade process. We can't have it completely broken by then. Um, with our transition to being in the cloud, now we have the cloud is able to go and make those kinds of uh, queries without having to have uh, upgraded software. So if there's a new manufacturer that comes out or Dell changes the way that the API works that we pull down warranty information, we can have that updated in the cloud 
you know, overnight, whereas doing it on premise was, uh, you know, was a big struggle. So, uh, you know, doing things in the cloud is going to improve that kind of process. All right, so let's talk about our connectors. Um, a connector is where we want to connect to almost always on-premise data, but also uh, cloud data as well. I only have mine pointed at uh, uh, a couple of things here. Um, if I look at my connectors, this is my uh, EPM server, um, and I have it uh, uh, connecting to a couple of different things. So, uh, sorry, it's taking its time switching over. There we go. Okay, so I have it connecting to Active Directory. Um, and so that's where I pull down my AD information so I can do some of those comparisons. I have it connecting to my data center discovery on premise. So, uh, you know, focusing on the data center, servers, VMs, ESX hosts, things like that, being able to find all those devices. And then I have it connected to uh, Endpoint Manager as well. So um, all that happens with the agent being installed on a single server. I don't have to go install a bunch of agents. So I kind of put it there once and then just add connectors on top of it. So I have the server added here. It doesn't technically have to be the, the EPM server. It does for some things, but um, if I was like connecting to Active Directory, it doesn't necessarily have to be the EPM server. But since it can do multiple connections, you might as well use it. Um, I can import from uh, CDW to get some purchasing information. I could import just generic CSV. Maybe I have some kind of third party uh, inventory information. There's the DCD discovery we talked about, Endpoint Manager, Active Directory, and SCCM. So these are just the connectors that are built out today. Um, this is going to expand. This is just kind of the minimum they needed to be able to release the product. So uh, we expect this to be a huge growth part for uh, Avanti Cloud to have, you know, a, a very large number of connectors. So know that that's very high priority for them to have. Um, agents. Um, so the cloud has its own agent. But it's not like our, our previous agents, you know, uh, be them user workspace management or EPM or anything like that. Um, it really is a whole new ballgame with this agent because of the way that they designed it to, to have uh, something called sensors. You know, a sensor is going to uh, read a piece of information um, or provide inventory related information. Um, and then a, uh, an actual agent. So being able to snap in different products, um, the roadmap is uh, making it so that you know third parties can snap in their software into our Avanti agents for the cloud. So that's going to make it just so much better to expand what we're doing without having to uh, you know have a big giant fat agent that does everything and we try and disable some stuff. It's kind of the opposite. It's incredibly lightweight. Um, uh, it doesn't have to deal with the same kind of upgrade and update challenges that we've had with previous technologies. Uh, for those that have used EPM for many years. Uh, they know that half of the battle is just managing the system, babysitting those agents um, with the lightweight nature and the automatic update nature of the agent. Um, that's going to uh, be a lot easier for us in the future. So you can see we have a Windows agent and a Mac agent um, and a Linux agent um, associated with Avanti Cloud. All right, lastly, I want to talk about the automation fabric. So you saw this a tiny bit. Um, with me creating some automatic engines or some automatic uh, actions to, to happen on certain devices. Now you can see where we can connect to multiple different systems. So this is just a small list of all the uh, uh, connectors uh, for automation that we have out of the box. So you know, connecting to AirWatch or Remedy or Citrix Zen Mobile, uh, Service Manager, Mobile Iron, Office 365, Nutanix, SoftLayer, VMware, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So if you want to be able to do an action, you want to be able to do something with Office 365, here's an option where we can wipe deleted user accounts or change plan setups or disable a plan. Or uh, if you want to uh, talk to Mobile Iron because that's your MDM solution, if you wanted to list devices, or get device details, et cetera. Those are the connectors that we have associated with uh, our automation fabric. Um, and this connects to on-premise Avanti automation as well if you have uh, an, an existing implementation of uh, Avanti automation. So that's where we're going to take it really to the next level of being able to have this be the center of the Avanti universe because we can use this automation to reach out to all of our different uh, systems. So um, Brian, somebody asked a question um, early on in your uh, demo. They're, they're wanting to know if you can implement Ivanti Cloud in both test and production environments, or do we just have one environment? Would they need separate tenants, um, multiple connectors just to a single tenant? Do you have any idea about that? 
So um, I, I'm going to make a guess here because I, I don't know this for a fact, but I believe you need to have multiple tenants because okay. um, right now as it stands today, there isn't a huge amount of scoping associated with it. Um, right. And so you would potentially be doing things in very broad brush strokes. So I believe you would have two tenants. You can see my tenant up here at the top is called NCSI. Um, you would just have two of them um, and one of them would be prod and one of them would be test and you can just do everything you want in test um, for testing purposes. Cool, thank you. Um, all right, so uh, we have one question here. Uh, how connectors are intended to work with other cloud products? Uh, I hear, heard there would need to be a cloud connector created and a connector then be built per cloud product before you can integrate with third-party tools. Is this correct? So um, generally speaking, yes. Uh, if you want to go connect it to XYZ other cloud service, you're going to need to have this automation fabric be able to uh, be able to do that. So the automation fabric is a concept of being able to go and do something in another system. So if all you're trying to do is reach out to a third party and do something, it's going to be more automation. Our connectors are more of a concept of ingesting information. If you want to connect a mobile iron, not just to reset a device, but you want to regularly ingest that information, that's where you would need to have a connector. So um, yes, there is going to be some work uh, set up on how we're going to be able to connect to those different systems. But if you're just wanting to reach out and push an action, automation fabric is probably the right answer. If you want to ingest information, then our connectors are probably the, the, the right answer. Um, all right, we've got a question here. Is there a limit to how many connectors? Um, there probably is. I don't know what that is. Um, uh, I have three here, and I'm sure I could add the other ones without any error messages. Um, but that's something we can find out. Um, the great part about the cloud, though, is usually it's pretty scalable in terms of uh, sizing. So uh, that's something we can find out. Um, okay, so that's uh, that's Avanti Cloud. Um, if we jump back over here to our, our presentation here, um, a little bit more about the the, the product itself. Uh, it's a subscription product, and you pay for each individual device. So if you have a thousand computers. You, buy, you pay for 1,000 licenses. Um, and the uh, standard uh, MSRP price is $15 per device per year. Um, but there's uh, uh, really a couple cool things about it is uh, it's included in the enterprise license agreement, either Unified IT or PIC2. So mm -hmm. you probably heard about it before. We did a whole webinar series on what the ELA is and, and how it works. But if you uh, go in to purchase um, the, the ELA, the, the Avanti Cloud, is included as part of it. Um, as well, uh, something called Avanti Insight. Uh, this came over from uh, our purchase of uh, company AppSense. Um, in the user workspace management suite, there was a, a product called Insight that did some similar things, tracked log on times, things like that. Um, that product is going end of life. So if you owned Insight or you owned the Desktop Now suite that included Insight, um, they're actually going to give you a free year's worth of it. Um, since that product is um, is getting end of life. Um, uh, sorry to let down anyone that didn't actually attend Interchange, um, but if you did go to Interchange, you actually get a year free of the Avanti Cloud. So um, I heard a rumor yesterday, and I don't know this for a fact, so take this with a grain of salt, but they told me that that URL was going to be dead by the end of today. So you should have oh, gotten wow. an email link. Yeah, I again, take it with a grain of salt, whether it's actually true right. or not. But please go check your email. Go and try and redeem that. Um, I had, I thought I had it in the uh, in the slide deck here, the actual URL itself. Um, I'll just post it in the in the chat or the Q and A as we get later on. You just go to a website, you you log into the community and say redeem. It's not hard to do, um, but uh, you definitely want to do it very very quickly. So if if you went to interchange. Uh, please make sure to um, uh, click on that URL. Um, all right, so that was uh, Avanti Cloud, net new product, something we're very excited about. Uh, there's another product uh, in the portfolio uh, that is uh, that has come to fruition. It's the Avanti Security Controls, or ISEC. Uh, and I think the E is supposed to be lowercase there, but you know, uh, Avanti Security Controls. And, and where did it come from? What is it? Well, really, it's a culmination of a couple of different things. Uh, many of you are familiar with the Avanti patch for Windows product, um, you know, the old Shavlik Protect product. Um, well, we're taking that and application control that does all the privilege management and application whitelisting and blacklisting from the user workspace management suite, 
piling on um, Linux patching. Right now it's only Red Hat, but that's going to expand here in the future. And bringing to the table a CVE to patch uh, integration component. So uh, uh, vulnerability scanning systems like Qualys or something like that, being able to ingest their information and map those CVEs over to patch uh, information. Like I said, the security team speaks a different language than us. So uh, having it be able to map between the two of them. So all of those things come together into the new product called Avanti Security Controls. And if you're on previous versions like Patch for Windows, you're going to be forced to change to this. It's really not some brand new out of, you know, out of nowhere product. It's just a bigger, fancier version of Patch for Windows with more features. Um, and you don't have to pay for it. So just know that that will eventually happen. Your console is going to change and uh, show the new uh, Vaunty Security Controls version. Uh, for those that haven't used Patch for Windows in the past, um, I, I love this fetching technology. It is just absolutely dynamite. Um, at patching servers. I think that's what it was born and bred to do. So uh, it gives you a quick patch view. I love the little uh, colors that it shows there so I can easily at a glance understand if my servers are out of date um, or patched up. Um, it does things like, uh, you know, stop services before we install patches, send an email to the system administrator and tell him what patches we're putting on his server, um, take a snapshot through VMware before we apply a patch. So lots of cool things that are very, very server focused. Agentless, you know, we don't have to put an agent on the machines. Um, it's not that it can't do workstations; it absolutely can. Um, but oftentimes, we find customers that uh, really love it on the on the server side. So that's the uh, ISEC product, um, our Avanti security controls. Um, all right, a couple of other things I want to talk about: um, uh, Endpoint Manager, um, Endpoint Manager uh, 2019.1 um, has a June release coming up. So you know, next month we should see 2019.1. Um, land. One of its big features is, you know, you've heard me say this a couple of times already, and you know, obviously Avanti heard this request a lot, and so they're having to be pretty pervasive through all of its products. Is that same CVE mapping to patches? So being able to take that CVE information and map that across. So security team gives us an export from their tool. Us being able to say, oh, here's the patches that we need to uh, apply associated with that. Um, not technically interchange related, but I got a bunch of people on the phone here that use EPM, so I wanted to bring it up. If you haven't seen it already, there was a security vulnerability in the EPM server. Um, versions 2017.3, 2018.3, and 2018.1 were all vulnerable. So you need to go and grab a patch. Um, I believe it's SU2 to, uh, to 2018.3 and SU3 to 2017.3, but don't take my word for it. Follow that link right there. Um, and you need to apply that to your core server. It's relatively simple. You don't need to apply it to your workstations. We just put it on the server. It patches something um, and resolves that security problem. So please, if you haven't done that, go take a look at it. Note that 2017.3 and 2018.3 are small patches, just service updates. But 2018.1, you actually need to upgrade to 2018.3 first. So um, that's just a little bit bigger upgrade. Um, uh, you're going to need to pay attention to. So uh, if you haven't already, please go take a look at that, uh, that link. All right, let's talk a little bit about user workspace management. So um, our UWM 2019.1 uh, release is, is happening right now. I just got a new copy of the release notes uh, just yesterday. So the, the binaries are either available or should be available for the next couple of days. Um, uh, we have some great integration with automation. Uh, user workspace management used to be kind of on a little bit of an island. Um, now it is integrated with uh, Avanti Automation, so we can have uh, automatic connections between other Avanti products um, inside of UWM. Um, and they have a pretty cool import wizard for group policy. So for those who aren't familiar, uh, endpoint, uh, excuse me, Environment Manager um, it gives you the ability to set group policy objects. Well, before you kind of had to go do it on your own, now it's a nice little wizard that does it on your behalf. So you can suck in that kind of information and not have to go find the group policy templates and, and uh, things like that. So uh, that's uh, something new in the 2019.1 for user workspace management. All right, let's talk about uh, automation. So Avanti Automation, I, I think unless you were a former Res customer, um, and this is where uh, the, the Avanti Automation came from, um, most people don't know about it. So uh, one thing I wanted to bring up is to, to remind everyone that automation, you get it for the Avanti products that you own. For example, if you own Endpoint Manager, you get Avanti Automation to connect to Endpoint Manager. 
if you own uh, ISM, you get Avanti uh, automation to connect to Service Manager. Um, if you want to go connect to other sources, you know, Active Directory or uh, Salesforce or ServiceNow or, you know, insert whatever other of the bazillion connectors that we have, you have to go and purchase that. But it is built in, and that's our go-forward strategy from an automation perspective is uh, Avanti Automation. So um, there's a new release for 2019.1 as well um, that, you know, just does some improvements supporting uh, Windows 2019, uh, improving the job search results, uh, et cetera. So if you haven't ever looked into uh, automation, definitely go do it. Uh, you can set up some cool things to, to take the humans out of the equation um, as part of your, your processes. Um, all right, last thing I want to talk about um, uh, another new ish product, um, and that's asset manager. Um, so, asset management has been, uh, you know, talked about and attempted, and uh, there's been lots of different kind of uh, interaction around this uh, business objective over time. Um, and I think it's finally starting to coalesce and gel around something. And, and the product is asset manager. Um, a lot of customers ask me, or they they make the statement, "We need asset management," um, and I I kind of think, well, what what does that mean? Lots of different people interpret ad, uh, asset management in different ways. So I think this is a good slide to talk about the differences between what, for example, something like Avanti Cloud or Endpoint Manager would give us. Avanti Cloud or Endpoint Manager are going to give us discovery data. That's where you can see it kind of the upper right wheel, maybe about 2 o'clock on the wheel there. Um, and that's interesting. And that's part of asset management. Being able to find things out there is important. But it's, it's by no means the extent of it. So if, you, if all you need to do is find it, great. Let's look at Cloud or EPM, and we can find your data. But when you need to start bringing in other things into the equation, uh, be that contract data, or purchase data, vendor data, location data, all of these things when they need to start being brought into uh, the conversation, that's when we need to start looking at um, asset management. And kind of the concept behind it is, uh, we have this thing called ITAM, that's just IT asset management, the fancy term for uh, asset manager. Um, it really needs to be born and bred in the acquisition cycle. So uh, if I have a magic wand, I can say, I want to start a couple company from scratch, and I want to have the correct policy. It would start with the asset request. It goes through request management. It goes through purchasing. It goes through receiving. All of that information is populated into the ITAM repository. So things like the purchase date, the purchase price, the, the date that we received it, where its location is, all that information would be born directly with that record just right from the get-go. Um, so that's where we want to be in the long run. Um, but you know, in the short term, we need to do things like our physical inventory and using our discovery tools to ingest that information into our same ITAM repository. Um, but then on top of that, once we've got that device, we also need to understand more about procurements and contracts and uh, fiscal things like you know chargebacks or cost allocations, depreciation, all these kind of accounting related things. When they start coming into play, um, it uh, you know that's when you decided that you definitely need ITAM. Um, and you know I've heard a very interesting saying, and I believe it to be true. Um, when you're talking about IT asset management. 80% of it is process, 20% of it is technology. Uh, so we can't come in and with one piece of software install and say, okay, there you go. All your assets are going to be just fine now. You know, it doesn't work that way. We need to create business processes. We need to adhere to them. Um, and, and then we need to implement a tool. So kind of keep that in the back of your head when you're thinking about ITAM or, or someone in your organization is bringing that up. Remind them that it's mostly process. Um, and our software can help facilitate that, um, but you know that's kind of where our specialty is. We have a whole team of consultants that can come out and help create this process for you. Uh, I always like to say we get in a conference room, we get someone from IT, someone from uh, you know facilities, someone from purchasing, someone from HR, and we draw it up on a whiteboard. How do we purchase equipment, or how do we provision users, or whatever it needs to be, and we workshop it out. And we, you know, kind of arm wrestle and fist fight over what the details are, and we help create that process. Then we go and try and implement it in technology. So you got to start with the process first. Um, a couple of things that, you know, asset manager, if if you're still on the, the fence of, wow, well, do I really need it? 
Um, well, some of these can help, you know, if you're asking these kinds of questions, you know, do I need to know about stock levels? How many, you know, T36 laptops do I have in stock in Shanghai? Um, do I need to understand, um, you know, what unauthorized software is running out there? Do I need to be able to find the user um, by location? Um, do I need to be able to find assets that are non-discoverable? Things like that. So uh, these are some kind of key indicators if you um, uh, are not sure whether you want to try Asset Manager or not. Um, lastly, uh, if you uh, haven't heard the news, we actually have a new hire here at NCSI, a gentleman named Todd Hogan. Uh, he comes over from Avanti, and he was actually the product manager for Asset Manager. So he helped uh, you know, conceive the product and build it up to the way that it is today. So um, I would argue that there is uh, no one better in the country uh, at Avanti Asset Manager, and he's a new employee of NCSI and can help us out with projects. So uh, if you have an asset management project uh, coming up or you're thinking about it or talking about it, uh, he's a wealth of knowledge, even just from a conversation perspective. Um, if you haven't dealt with this before, we're not the heavy-handed salespeople. There's no salespeople on this call, as an example. Lisa and myself are engineers. We really want to try and educate our customers about the product. So yep. uh, don't, don't feel uh, nervous to reach out to us. We'll hook you up with an engineer, and we'll make the salespeople stay at home that day. So uh, <laughs> if you want to just have a conversation and talk more about the process, Todd is going to be great to be able to do that. Um, all right, lastly, uh, we have uh, just kind of a reminder about that ELA. We talked about it a little bit, as we said, the uh, Avanti Cloud options. Um, I just want to show this slide for anyone that hasn't seen it. Unified IT is all of the pillars. You unlock everything in here. Um, and uh, pick two means you pick two different of the pillars, as demonstrated kind of down there at the bottom. Um, there's, there's so much content to go over, we can't really talk about it today. We actually have on our YouTube channel um, an entire five-part series where we kind of, we don't even do a deep dive into each one of these, because even that's not enough time, but we spend an hour on each one of the pillars and talk about what you get as part of it. And, and hopefully you can see still some of the unifying features that Avanti Cloud is going to uh, help bring all of these uh, technologies um, together. Um, so that's it. Uh, I, I want to kind of pass it back over to Lisa, and she's going to pick us a backpack winner. So if you want to come up with one of the best questions and let us know, and we'll get the backpack heading out to that person. You know, um, and it's a question that I actually don't know the answer to. Brian, you might. Um, Mr. Jimmy Fawcett asked, is the cloud supposed to be a single pane of glass to where we will not have to log into each EPM, ITSM, or ITAM separately? Um, that's a fabulous question, and <laughs> I want to know some of the backstory. Um, the, the code name for the project was Project Uno, meaning one, meaning one console. So know that that is the long-term desire. Yeah. We are a long ways away from that. So I'm a bit of a pessimist. Um, I don't think we're going to see that for a couple of years. Um, so we're going to keep that EPM console around for at least another couple of years um, to see until we're mature enough. Because, I mean, geez, open up the EPM console. How many checkboxes are there? There's 10,000 million in there. So to be able to port those over, be able to bring that functionality over is, is going to take some time. So in, in a couple of years, yes, uh, we'd be able to do that. You know, they should have stuck with Uno, probably. It would be less confusing than Cloud. <laughs> no way. Just saying. I apologize. There is a whole bunch of questions in the Q&A that I yeah. skipped over. So we should have, let, let's try and review some of those. We still have a couple of minutes here. Um, to, uh, but we can make sure to give that backpack away because I like that question as well. Um, uh, tell you what, uh, uh, let me talk about the follow-up, and then we'll kind of continue on with more of the questions. You guys can stick around for as long as you want. Um, if you want to follow up, just send an email to sales at ncsi.us or myself or Lisa. There's our email addresses right there. We'd be happy to uh, uh, help you out with, with anything that you need. Um, then we'll also have someone from NCSI reach out to see if there's any, any additional services or any help you need uh, with the product. So I mean, just like John said, if you want some of those extra T-shirts that we have or some of those tattoos, uh, you know, please email him. Um, so let's try and go through um, some of these questions and see if we can't answer them. So sorry, I wasn't scrolling through. Uh, I should have. I know there's a lot. <laughs> okay, so uh, uh, his service manager does Skype functionality extend uh, to Teams with Office 365? Oh, and um, Lisa already answered that question. So let me skip yeah. to the one. I answered. I answered some of them. Sorry. Okay, no problem. 
can you talk about implementing Avanti Cloud for testing production? Oh, we already got past that one. We answered that. Um, do you know what development timeline is for Avanti Cloud? Right now, Cloud is missing basic functionality functionality like removing devices or connectors. So um, it's being developed every single day. Um, and it yeah. is uh, the, the, I don't want to say the sole focus of Avanti, but the primary focus. For, for those that are uh, not familiar, um, a gentleman named Rex uh, was a longtime um, product manager over uh, EPM. He's the product manager over the Avanti cloud. So you know, they took their most senior trusted product manager and put him in charge of it to, to make sure that it gets uh, completed. So um, they're going to have new releases every week, every month. Um, so uh, I understand as well, it is a relatively basic product today um, and needs some improvement, but I think that improvement is going to come very quickly. So um, uh, a question about extraction. Um, I don't remember any huge extraction news from uh, no. Interchange. Lisa, was there anything that jumped out to you? No, there was nothing new. Um, I know that there was a recent release of an update, but I don't think there was anything earth shattering in it. Um, I did not hear a peep about extraction while we were there. Yeah, and, and I don't think we have a, a late late release. I think 2018.4 is still the latest um, extraction. Yeah, release, so. I think that's it. Um, don't make that sound like extraction is going away or anything. It is still oh, yeah. a no. huge part of the reporting and our go-to reporting suite. So um, uh, it's absolutely still uh, central to what we do. It's just you know it's doing its thing and not a huge amount of uh, changes right now. Um, uh, so a question. So with third-party applications, uh, will the normalization extend to that? So the answer is yes. The normalization that's kind of the secret sauce, the magic going on on the back end. So when we're going to ingest information from those third-party locations, the normalization actually absolutely kicks in and makes sure we don't have duplicate data. So I showed you a little bit in the cloud there where um, we had connectors coming in from multiple locations. So for example, um, I think I had some devices that existed in all three of these scans yet I don't have those duplicate devices. So being able to connect to a third-party location, that normalization and reconcilia reconciliation uh, absolutely happens. Um, next question, do you have a list of third-party connectors and is it limited uh, or if an app has an API, can that be connected? So as it stands right now today, these are the connectors that we have built. So if you don't see it, it's not there. But this is what we're talking about is, the, is a huge focus inside of Avanti. Now that they've got the, the, the kind of the base layer, the platform created, um, working on connectors is, is the top list on their priority. So um, it's absolutely going to be um, improved upon over time. And again, automation fabric might be um, uh, a, a different way to create that kind of integration that we're talking about. So, um, we can uh, talk to different uh, web servers and APIs and so forth as part of uh, the uh, automation fabric. So it might not technically be a connector, it might be part of the automation fabric is where we extend to connect to those third parties uh, you know, a little bit faster. And here you can see, at least from an automation perspective, all the different third parties that we have, the different categories. Um, I know there's another agent in connection with the Avanti agent for EPM. What is the footprint on the local device? So they, they reimagined the agent from the ground up. And, and some of it, I don't know how much is, is sensitive information, but uh, I attended uh, something at Interchange that um, uh, showed the architecture of it and how they intelligently thought it out between these agents and sensors. Um, and the concept is, is it, throw away your previous logic of how agents worked. It's a brand new framework. And I don't know if you saw that download. It was only uh, 19 megabytes, you know, for example. The agent is small. It installs in, uh, geez, uh, five seconds? Ten I was going to say, it took no time. Yeah. yeah I, I actually was like, did it install? Yeah, yeah, I did the same thing. Wait a minute. That, that was really fast. <laughs> so, Gone are the days of these big, giant, fat agents to do so many functions that you don't even really use. Gone is the legacy, um, and it is lean, it is, it is mean, um, and uh, it can absolutely coexist with your existing environment uh, today. Um, does or will cloud be able to connect to on-prem? So uh, yes, uh, the way that it connects is very, very easy. You have something called the connector servers. That's just a fancy way of saying, it's an agent 
that is installed on a server to do connections. Um, and what's kind of cool about it, I don't know if it talks about it, and it doesn't really talk too much about it there, but you install the same agent on, the, the one I installed on my laptop is the same I put on the server to create these connections. So again, in that 19 megabytes is all you need. Um, and then it gives me the ability to detect all this stuff. So this is on-premise Active Directory, on-premise SCCM, on-premise DCD, on-premise EPM. So absolutely be able to connect to uh, on-premise technology. Uh, question, can we add parameters uh, to the decision-making process? So I assume that was when we were talking about our, uh, our actions um, and part of our automation fabric. Again, I apologize. I, my Q&A wasn't scrolling, and I thought, oh, wow, no one's asking any questions. I just must be doing so great a job explaining it. I did the um, same thing. So, uh, yes, we have the ability to do parameters. So um, you can see when we go in and are creating individual tasks, there's options for parameters or variables or, or you know, whatever you want to call them. Um, so, you know, here's the different parameters. Um, so you could put in information in here to be able to be passed across. So that action on a machine could pass over to this service management, uh, service manager connection, the computer name or the username or, you know, whatever. So you have the ability to pass parameters across in those actionable items. Um, okay, uh, keep going. Is there a separate cloud agent? I think we already kind of described that. So, uh, oh, is there a couple of agent needed to show the device view? Well, let me talk about that really quick. Um, I have on-premise EPM, and so most of these were just sucked up through my on-premise EPM. And the way that I can tell is there's this thing called real time. Real time is the uh, the real time intelligence. The thing that I think is really cool. So these are only the ones that I have with the new Avanti cloud agent, and it shows that real time is enabled. So if I get rid of that, you can see all the ones that are empty here don't have a cloud agent on it. So when I click on here, this only came from uh, the EPM data. So I don't get that real time, um, but I can still see the, you know, the detailed view and most of the information. I just can't see what its CPU is right now, or how much memory it's using, or its location. I'm missing those real-time parameters, but the, the rest of the parameters we sucked in from, uh, from EPM. Um, all right, next question. Uh, our connectors are intended to work with other cloud products. I've heard that we need, oh, I think we already answered that, that we might need um, yeah. uh, uh, integration. Uh, automation fabric and connectors are, are a little bit different, and Maybe we need automation for when we're just trying to do something, but connectors when we're trying to ingest information. Um, next question, we set our local admins via group policy. Is there a way to filter out those um, that we already allow for local admins on that chart? Uh, that's a good question. I actually don't know the answer to that. Um, I'm assuming that we can pull it up and take a look at it and create that filter relatively quickly. Um, so uh, we should be able to change this chart uh, to not include those and change what the expected and unexpected is. So um, I don't know the answer to that directly, but um, I would assume that we have the ability to do that. So that's something we can dig into and, and find out. Uh, next question, if you don't stop, uh, if you don't set up trending, then Avanti doesn't store the data correct. Um, I wouldn't say it doesn't store it. It only stores it one, one instance of it. So if I click on the, the logon times or the CPU usage or um, device uptime or you know, anything, it's just one data point. Trending says keep multiple iterations of this data point. So uh, you, you probably don't need multiple, you don't need to trend the IP address because you know, who really cares what the IP address changes to over time. Um, but something that impacts the user or is a health-related thing. Maybe you want to trend the CPU information. I want to see when they're spiking on CPU and see if I can help troubleshoot associated with it. Um, all right. Uh, but, but, but what connectors can we use with the smart advisor, something like CrowdStrike? Right now, no, because we kind of talked about what connectors are built out of the box. Um, but, uh, you know, CrowdStrike is an Avanti uh, uh, partner, and I bet that's something that they're going to connect in the relatively near future. So um, when, when we are able to do that, then yes, absolutely, our uh, smart advisors would be able to ingest that information and uh, know more about it. Uh, we'd have some basic interaction. So, for example, in your real-time intelligence, if you wanted to click on AV, 
CrowdStrike is installed, we understand that, and we know that it's part of the process, but we wouldn't have, you know, connections and APIs to the, 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 the server yet. Um, uh, why are planning on adding Service Manager to bring a better ticket system online? I don't know if that's... Oh, exactly that was that. a different conversation. So. Oh, okay. Uh, does, war does Warranty Info use the existing data analytics connectors or the new cloud connectors? So um, the short answer is it's, it's uh, eventually going to be the cloud version, um, but like right now in my environment, it's actually pulling that from the on-premise data analytics. So that information was ingested. Uh, from data analytics, but we want to slowly get away from that, you know, and have it be in the cloud instead. So um, if it's still pulling it from that on-premise data, uh, we want to make that change to have it pull it from the, the cloud-based. Um, what kind of information is sent to the cloud with the connector? So technically with the connector, it sends all the data, you know, I have a connector here to my EPM system, and so you could say it uploads every piece of inventory information in my EPM database. So that's quite a bit of data. You know, I, I don't want to make downplay it or make it sound like, oh, it's just a tiny bit of information. But no, it's every inventory attribute gets sent up uh, to the server. So for that particular connector, it's it's a lot of information. Um, and then uh, the same thing probably applies for Active Directory. We're going to pull in most of the attributes associated with computers. Same thing with Data Center Discovery. We're going to pull in all the attributes associated with that. Um, so it's, it's quite a bit of information gets pushed across that connector. What ports are, uh, what ports are used for the connectors between the cloud and on-premise EPM? Um, that's actually pretty cool. It's just a single port. Uh, MQTT is the name of the protocol. Um, and uh, I don't know if it shows it here. But it's like TCP 8883, I think it is. Uh, and so it's one simple port, and then that's everything. That's how the agent communicates. That's how our connectors communicate. Remember, the connector goes across the, the agent. If I didn't have this here, when you log into yours for the first time, it's going to say, oh, you want to add a server? We'll go download the same old regular agent that you put on everything else, and it's going to be your connector server as well. So um, you know, it all goes across that, uh, that communication. Uh, our network is air-gapped. How much is going to be available in on-premise premise version? Unfortunately, none. Um, this is a cloud-only product. The way that they bring the real-time intelligence, the way they bring the patch intelligence, um, it's, it's unfeasible to do it on-premise. Uh, so it's unfortunate, but uh, you know, th this uh, product, not only in just name only of Avanti Cloud, is going to only exist um, up in the cloud. Um, is DCD an inventory an Avanti product? Uh, yes, I should be use the um, uh, the acronym, but it's uh, data center discovery. So data center discovery focuses on the server side of discovery. So yeah, we can go find workstations and a couple of servers and printers and desktops and whatever. But what about VMware servers? What about SANs? What about um, WebSphere instances. So data center discovery, I actually have mine uh, right here if you want to see what it looks like. It's a web-based interface. You um, tell it to go and query different subnets, put in the credentials associated with it, and uh, it gives you ability to find um, you know, data center uh, related things. So like for example here, here's some of my scans. I can go into the project results um, and I can say look at all the applications that I find. So finding SQL servers, finding Hyper-V instances, finding Exchange servers, um, applications, uh, looking here in the, uh, the what applications it's going to find. Um, oh, I clicked off of it, but you know, WebSphere and Apache and all this server-related stuff. So that's our discovery engine for the data center. Uh, and yes, we can ingest that information here into it. It's actually, uh, you probably saw on the logo page uh, right at the start, it's powered by iQuate. So it's a third party product, but it's actually included in the ELA. It is right here under discovery, I don't know, somewhere. It's under data, uh, data center discovery. Um, next question, can we write custom connectors uh, with other API driven systems? Eventually, yes, right now, no. So we don't have access to that. Um, but in the, in the coming months, we should be given access to that kind of uh, interaction so that we can write custom APIs. Um, if you integrate with on-premise automation, then you could do that today. So we have our on-premise automation fabric. One of the integrations here is Avanti Automation. 
um, and it's in here somewhere. So you could point at uh, Avanti Automation, and then Avanti Automation would do that request. I don't know where it's at, somewhere else in here. Um, but yes, the, the future is absolutely planning to integrate with other API systems. Um, I heard the URL was only good for the time of interchange. I could be wrong. Uh, so that lends more credence to my comment about uh, how I heard the rumor that it's going to go away. So maybe they told everyone you had to click on it when you were at interchange, and they extended it one week past it. So regardless, uh, hit me up if you uh, uh, need that URL. Um, or when we get done with the questions, I'll even go find it and put it up on the screen so everyone can see it. Um, uh, is patch for Windows customers, do I get application control for free in ISEC? Um, unfortunately, no. Uh, you get all the same functionality that you had today, you know, the patching for Windows, but if you want to add application control, that's an additional licensed item. So um, it's one of my favorite features. I love uh, the privilege management in application control, um, giving out admin rights, taking away admin rights, things like that. Uh, but it's something you have to pay for to get. If you just use Patch for Windows for now, you're not losing any any functionality by moving to ISEC, um, but uh, you do need to pay for application control. Uh, did you say Patch for Windows get upgraded to ISEC? Uh, same kind of question. You you don't get it for free. You 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 can use ISEC for free, but it, there's a separate license for application control. It's still something you have to you have to pay for. Um, does the VM automatically snap in the patch management utility work with Avanti Automation and VMware uh, and thusly need a license? No, it doesn't. So it's standalone. Um, if you want to know uh, the, the logic behind it, I can connect to my uh, ISEC server here really quick. Um, uh, Shablik was actually owned by VMware at one point. So we integrate with VMware very, very well. We don't integrate with Hyper-V right now. That's kind of a uh, a big wish list of everyone out there. But when we create a deployment template, so if you come in here and say, I want to create a virtual machine standard deployment, for example, um, you say part of that is you want to, oh, that one's grayed out. Uh, let's pick one of these other ones. Uh, there's a checkbox right here that says, take a pre-deployment snapshot. And we, we know that it's part of VMware because we actually connect to VMware directly right here. Here's my ESX hosts. Here's my vCenter. So I don't even have to go and find the devices. They all just show up right here um, in my vCenter instance, and I add them for scanning. So no, it's a completely standalone, separate product. It doesn't have to do with automation. doesn't have to do with anything else um, to create things like snapshots as we're doing patching. So um, the reason it does that, um, there's a lot of people out there that aren't going to use any other parts of Avanti technology, and they just want that patching engine. So they've tried to create previously patched for Windows and now ISEC, kind of a standalone product um, that's not so connected to everything else because uh, a lot of people just buy it by itself. Um, okay, someone put out there our YouTube channel. Um, are they looking to replace extraction with cloud? Uh, short term, no. Extraction is going to stick around for quite some time. Um, but I would expect several years from now, that we would start leaning in that direction. But that's a long ways off. Um, so keep up with extraction. It's still the go-to um, uh, dashboarding and reporting technology. But yeah, in, in multiple years from now, uh, you know, that's uh, definitely part of the vision. Is tenant data separated from one another and how? Um, yes, it's separate. I don't know how it's separate. Um, uh, that's something we can find out from a security perspective. Uh, and I can tell you for all you government and federal customers out there, um, we were speaking uh, specifically with Tom Davis, the CTO of uh, Avanti, about FedRAMP certification. It's a lot harder than it sounds because you need to get so many um, certifications for all the subcomponents. If you use some free .NET library, you have to have that certified for FedRAMP first before you can certify your product. So we use a whole bunch of you know, uh, libraries and connections and things like that. So they all need to be certified first. So it's not going to be FedRAMP certified for, for some amount of time. Um, they're working on it, but it's, it's not there today. Uh, but we can find out what it is from a, a separation perspective. Um, I can tell you when they created my instance, you know, I, I believe it's its own you know, pool of organized data, its own servers and so forth. But we can find out the specifics on that. Um, I'm currently using EPM patch and service desk. Would I already qualify for Avanti Cloud being included? So 
Uh, the, the short answer is probably not um, unless you have bought some kind of ELA um, because you're talking about endpoint management and service desk and uh, patch. That's some of them, but that by its own doesn't technically qualify you. However, you'd be surprised how many customers we talk to that we, when we start adding up products, well, you got to pay your maintenance on EPM, you got to pay your maintenance on service desk, you got to pay your maintenance on patch, you got to pay your maintenance on application control or whatever. It's not that much more to switch over to a PIC2 ELA. So yeah. hit us up, we can show you um, whether it's cost effective to switch over to an ELA, but most likely you're not uh, entitled to it right out of the box. Uh, unless you've already bought the ELA or went to interchange, uh, there's a good chance you have to pay for it. Or like I said, if you're already relatively heavily invested in Avanti products, it's not that far to jump up to uh, any way. Correct. Um, tenant data is encrypted at rest. Again, I don't know that question. Um, Matt's beating me up over the security stuff. We'll find out and we'll get you more information on that. Um, how do you check if it installed uh, successfully? We we're just talking about the cloud agent. Um, it takes a little bit of time for it to show up from an inventory perspective. I was a little surprised at this, that, hey, where are these things? They have to do an inventory, they have to pull, blah, blah, blah. So I think on average it, it was maybe like 15 minutes, give or take, after I installed an agent before it showed up here in the devices section. Take that with a grain of salt. Um, uh, this one down here that one of my engineers installed took a day, and I don't know why. Maybe it wasn't online. Who knows why that took. Oh, that's weird. Mine took like five minutes. It was yes, you're showing up right away. This is yeah. one of the engineers, Jonathan. He said, hey, I installed it. And it wasn't there yesterday, but it just barely showed up this morning. Oh, my gosh. So I'm not sure why that is. Um, uh, but, but that, that was around the decision-making process of ramaging or replacing. Okay, I think I remember that question. It says, can we put parameters associated with it uh, as it relates to the smart advisors? So um, I don't know the answer to that. Let's go click on it and see if we can find anything that jumps out at us um, from a recommendation perspective. Uh, I don't see any modifiable parameters in this particular smart advisor. Now, I believe you could go create your own. Um, if you come up here to your dashboard and you create a widget, you can create your own custom one. So you go change from smart advisors to custom, and then you can say, okay, I want a, an informational panel, and then you can add parameters associated with that. So if you want to come to the table with the logic of, okay, the data source is going to be the Windows edition, and I'm going to create a chart associated with it and filter out enterprise because we're going to keep that, but not pro or you know whatever. You could somewhat create a similar kind of thing, but no, there's not a way you can take that smart advisor and say, ah, well, our useful life is you know 48 uh, months or something like that. Um, the access control part, uh, that just user setup then, right? Not some cool application whitelisting thing or something. Um, and, uh, yeah, so the, uh, I believe what the question is asking is in the application control, what is that? Well, that came over from, um, again, from our AppSense user workspace management uh, suite, and it is application whitelisting and blacklisting and user privileges. So giving out um, uh, individual rights, uh, admin rights for just certain applications, or um, taking away uh, different functions uh, if you, the user already is an administrator. Um, all right, so uh, I have been given the hook. I apologize uh, for running over on time. I didn't get through all the questions. We're going to review these after the fact, and we can we have your contact information. We can just email you out and try and follow up with the remaining questions. Um, but uh, I'd like to thank everyone for attending, and, and hopefully you got your, um, your uh, pizza. Um, oh, uh, someone just put in the... Um, the, the the chat, the URL for the cloud offer, and, and that is what it is. So it's relatively simple, avanti.com forward slash cloud offer. Uh, so if you did attend Interchange, please, please, please go do that today to make sure yeah. it doesn't, um, uh, doesn't expire. I don't know if we're going to be able to uh, pull any strings to get it for you next week. So definitely take a look at that. Um, Lisa, thank you very much for attending and helping moderate. I appreciate it. Well, thank you. Um, and if anyone has any questions, please uh, reach out to us. Uh, again, here's our contact information. You can hit us up on uh, sales.ncsi.us. Our phone number is down there at the bottom. You can give us a call. Um, but thank you, everyone, for attending, and have a great day.